You're watching Morning Live. Thanks so much for tuning in on another somber morning uh, for another important but yet debilitating discussion. Now, government has described gender-based violence as a national crisis. More than 30 women were killed in the month of August alone, and August being Women's Month. A Minister of Women, Youth and Persons with Disabilities, Maite Nkwana Mashabane, and Justice Minister Ronald Lamula made a joint statement yesterday, and they say stronger interventions are needed as the country reels from the high numbers of women being killed. Now, people, including those on social media, are holding vigils and circulating petitions to highlight this particular issue. And to discuss this further this morning, we join now by Rosie Motene, who is a feminist author and board director for People Opposing Women Abuse. And uh, from our Seapoint studios, we joined by Professor Lengyu M. Kize, who is the Deputy Minister in the Presidency for Women, Youth and People with Disabilities. Thank Thanks so much to both of you for joining us for this very important discussion. Uh, Deputy Minister, I want to start with you because sitting here, it feels like deja vu. <coughs> we've been here before. We, we, we've had um, these discussions before. We've gone through these motions before. So as leadership in this country, what do you say to the nation at a time like this? Well, Sakina, thank you for having me. I must say, uh, since the news has uh, been breaking out in terms of this, uh, the killings that have taken place recently, we came uh, t together even in Parliament before the debate yesterday. We, w we reflected on what has happened and I must say, all of us have been extremely, extremely upset in terms of saying why after we have had a conversation of, about this national crisis under the leadership of the president with civil society, came up with, uh, with a, a, a summit document and a declaration that has been signed, which is giving life to the national strategic plan, uh, which will give uh, life to a council, which will oversee and guide our work on curbing gender-based violence and femicide. We all thought at long last we are on track. But what has happened has taken us back emotionally. Too much pain. We're identifying with all mothers, the whole country. And, and so the emotions are very high from all directions, I must say. Rosie. But we are staying on track. As someone, as, as a survivor, you mm. know, of gender-based violence, you've been there, you know, right in the thick of it. And mm. you looking at these stories, you know, listening mm. uh, to what people are going through. Some, unfortunately, have lost their lives mm. once again. What do you feel? Uh, uh, where does this take you? Um, first of all, I don't think we had a crisis from last year. Power's been around for 40 years. That's when the crisis started. So we need to acknowledge that this isn't something that's just erupted. This is something that we've been talking about. This is something that we've written memorandums, we've marched, we've opened up shelters, we've buried thousands, if not millions, of women. So um, we talk about the, the, the NSP, the National Strategic Plan. We talk about putting, um, imp implementing policies to help gender-based violence. But you look at our budget, where's the, where's the money going to come from? Because the, there's no money or, or budget allocated to that type of work. You know, so, so I think we need to, I don't know, a, a reshuffling of, 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 of plan and, and moving forward and, and a proper strategic plan working with activists on the ground, working with feminists on the ground because we're the ones who are seeing it. We're the ones who are, who are feeling it. We're the ones who have been living it for, for many, many years. Mm. And, and if you look at the statistics, I mm. mean... The picture couldn't be more grim. Mm. Um, according to uh, statistics from a social welfare organization, Badisa, they say that 3,915 women mm. and children were murdered in 2018 alone. Mm. Now, that gives you an average of 10 women and children every single day yeah. Yeah. murdered 
in South Africa. And these are just the ones we know And about. the ones that are making... Also remember, that could just be cold, straight murder. Remember uh, trauma. Remember trauma adds on to a post-traumatic stress disorder. So that's not accounting women who have committed suicide, women who have died from depression, women who have died from other related diseases from either rape or ongoing emotional and psychological trauma. So as much as we can put these figures out, we know for a fact that they aren't the truth because they don't reflect everybody in our society. You go to, to the grassroots area, you go to one of our offices um, that we have in power in Soweto with the, with the files that are sitting on the desks that, that, that our managers have to deal with. Those are the stories where women have been dealing with it on an ongoing basis, where they're either been opened up cases, they've been failed by the courts, they've been failed by the police, they have to go back to their perpetrators. Some don't make it home again, or make it out of their homes again. And then, as you say, Rosie, um, that's not the complete picture, mm. but even as it stands, it is still a horrific picture. Absolutely. Um, uh, Deputy Minister, you know, uh, speaking to that, and your department has met with the Department of uh, Justice and Correctional Services, so let's talk about the plans. You know, what sort of plans do we have in place to actually move us further along in terms of fighting this particular scourge? Well, concretely, we have to be we all agree that the issue of violence against women is an old phenomenon. Even during the apartheid years, bodies like POA and many other trauma centers were established in this country. But basically, why I refer to what happened last year, because that's when we said, let's revisit whatever we know, whatever we have been doing, so that it's not business as usual. I will explain what I'm saying. Within the, we, we have never worked in a coordinated, integrated fashion as we are do, doing today. I heard your guest saying there's no budget for this. Nothing is being done. You know, sometimes that's a problem. People don't understand that. As government, when you wake up, you don't just react in a vacuum. You have to create a framework and ensure that w whenever money is put into a, 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 a program, it's systematic, sustainable over a long period of time. Take the criminal justice system, for instance. Out of the year, last year's summit, which I don't take lightly, I've been on this track almost all my life from my student years of violence against women. But it's one important thing which I've realized after talking to women judges, the magistrates, uh, heads of police stations, it's clear, everybody's saying we have to bring our own activism. They are talking about, re they, they are already in programs. Some of the people from the, who are heads of police stations be, being enlightened and helped to deepen their understanding on the very issues that your guest is referring to in terms of the impact uh, of, of, of this kind of cruelty and this uh, crime against women in terms of immediate reaction that they cannot even articulate what has happened to them. And they also suffer from long-term consequences, which we often throw words around and say post-traumatic stress reaction and disorders. So also people are saying in the past, many cases you can throw around statistics and sometimes it means nothing because it's not representative of the, all the experiences of people, is talking to a few which happen to go to the prosecutor's office. The majority of cases end up not also being prosecutable. And there are all those challenges which within the criminal justice itself they are looking at and they are retraining and strengthening their systems. Of course we don't have the luxury of time. We all agree. But I still value uh, the step that has been taken to say if whatever program we run, we're not going to be looking at the budget of the women, youth and persons with disability. It's coming from the budget which Treasury has allocated within clusters of government. If there are social issues like the shelters, it's not social development alone. It's a cluster of department which is, has been budgeting in such a way that they contribute in a meaningful way to this. It's not enough because we are talking at the time when 
there are loss of lives. It's a very difficult time. But what I want to assure you is that we don't see this as a regular, everyday practice that we are taking. But we are saying, even to our partners in civil society, let's work together. This is not the time to throw our hands up. It's the time to consolidate whatever we are doing and ensure that we carry the people of South Africa with us in taking this struggle to its ultimate finality. As to who budgets for what, on the government side, it's top of the agenda of each and every department. The president was the first one to say, for this administration, I declare this, this a national crisis, mm. like youth unemployment. So mm. I, I, I think... But it has to be a crisis beyond the spoken word. It has to be mm. a crisis beyond the rhetoric and the summits and all sorts of workshops. And the because marches and everything else. The skeptic in me is sitting up right now and saying, but as I started out saying, we've been here before. Mm. We've had these conversations before. Why are we experiencing the same thing over and over? Because I'm thinking back at the outrage in South Africa um, uh, during the um, uh, Anine Boysen mm. case. And, and uh, we had the Karabo Mokwena situations. And you can go on reeling off a number of names mm. of women in whose name South Africans rose up. Mm. But here we are today again. And today we are saying Nene mm. Mkhwetiana. Why are we not moving forward, Rosie? Mm. I don't know. <laughs> We, I, I don't even have an answer for that because, as, as you said, we've been in this position. We've been saying the same things over and over again. We've marched. We've, we've, last year, we handed over the 24 demands um, to, to a summit which was, which was orchestrated and, 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 and implemented by women on the ground and government came to the, came, came, came to the forefront. So, so we're at, and, and we're at a dangerous point at, the, at this point because, because people are tired. Like you and I, we're, we're at this point where it's, we, enough is enough. The pot isn't even boiling over. The, the kitchen's on fire. The house is on fire. That's where we are. So what are we going to do, Deputy Minister? Because, and, and, and this is about concretely and uh, you know, moving uh, forward in a consistent and sustainable manner uh, that actually speaks to address the scourge and, and, and this fight against women and children and who they are and what they are. Mm. You know, Sakina, I don't want to go back in terms of saying we should understand the context we are in as South Africa. What we are dealing with today is not something which has just erupted. It's something which is telling us that 25 years down the line, this is where the family in South Africa is. Mm. So when we expect outcomes tomorrow, we might not be realistic in the sense that it's talking to our socialization patterns, the anger, the emotional uh, distress about the people's circumstances and so on. The, what, the action that we can take today are drastic measures to deal with those who have committed crimes. But the bigger responsibility is how do we work together on prevention programs? and also on the development of our young people. I mean, they are in the National Strategic Plan on gender-based violence and domestic. There's a huge component which look at work which has to be done from early child development, which will be intervention at a school level, at a community level. We're meeting with clergies who lead big structures who have also taken on the struggle to say we need something like a liturgy where they will talk to on a daily basis or within each and every sermon so that we conscientize the, our youth, we conscientize our men to begin to understand the impact of these actions on, on women's rights and the quality of life in general in South Africa and how it affects negatively virtually everything. Mm. If institutions of higher learning, we have work to do there in, mm. within the uh, institutions of higher learning to ensure that there is a, a common understanding of how should young people there be protected against other young people on campus, but also 
surrounding business communities there. Because what happened at UCT, for instance, I mean, the post office is a regular business center for students where they go and collect books, any information that they have. Those who have no access to data, we always say to them, at least there should be a, police, a, a, a post office around where uh, the campus is situated. But again, it means more work there needs to be done. Mm. On our side, as government and parliament, I've said we have to come up with a clear roadmap of what needs to be done, if it's revisiting the legislation. But so far, even the practitioners within the judiciary, it's clear that we can play around. We have enough in our hands to implement whatever drastic measures that we want to uh, implement, given the legislation that was coming, we've come up with and the policies. I haven't heard even the Minister of Finance taking a stand to say, do whatever you have, there's no budget for you. I haven't heard that word. So I think there are actionable things. And we are, when I said we have to remain focused and on track, on the part of civil society, we are fully aware. One of the things we have identified is that government lost that ability to, uh, to work in partnership with civil society and make sure that they are well resourced given the important work they are doing on a daily basis at a community level, especially uh, in the townships, in formal settlements, and especially those who have an arm in the rural areas. All those things need to be strengthened, those uh, social compacts, as a matter of agency, because that's where victims come out from and people are, ha are empowered to speak out and to articulate their cases so that mm -hmm. they, they reach a point where the prosecution is able to act immediately. Our sexual offences courts, the turnaround time, we've put it before the Minister of Justice that if they don't work in, uh, quickly and efficiently, then it's like we are denying the justice for women who have come forward and spoken out. Mm. Is this another major issue that we need to look at while they still working out the, the, the long-term plan is that, for instance, Monday evening, um, got two calls, distress calls late in the evening. A woman who had been raped went to Edenville Hospital, went to a local clinic. There were no rape kits. They couldn't help with PEP. So now this person then had to go to Hillbrow, but because of what's happening in town, we weren't able to help her. But then we, we found that the net care hospitals, which was out of her region, out of her, her, her neighborhood, but was able to get the necessary and urgent attention that she needed. So I think the most important thing is that we need to we need stronger actions at our police stations because too many too many cases are going unseen, too many cases, too many dockets are being disappear are disappearing. How does a docket disappear? That means somebody's paying for it and and, and, and it's initially it's 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 strategically put somewhere else or thrown away. We need rape kits at every at every government institution, every, every government hospital. We need PEP. This is this is our, our, our human right, you know. And um, so these are these are the urgent action that need to be taken on the ground while the government are still unraveling and looking at the 24 um, action plans which were handed to them by the total shutdown last year, and we implementing and putting budgets and so forth in place. So, of course, this is not the end of this conversation. No. Much more needs to be spoken about, but more importantly, much more needs to be done um, in this fight against this war on women and children and their bodies. And, uh, you know, uh, talking about uh, socialization and re-socializing uh, this society, what makes people think that it's okay for you to tell a woman what she should and should not wear. And, and I'm mentioning that as something very simple and banal to some. But you see, it starts there, where you think you have a right to tell women what they can and cannot do by thinking that you have a right to tell them what they can and cannot wear. Mm -hmm. Let's start with these simple things. But uh, we have to end it there. Thank you so much to Rosie Mutene, who is a feminist author and a board director for People Opposing Women Abuse, and Professor Tlengi Wemkize, who is the Deputy Minister in the Presidency for Women, Youth and People with Disabilities. And we're talking about violence and abuse of women and children in this country.